Good evening or good morning, everyone, depending where you're dialing in from. I'm Mary Kernick Cook, and I'm Network Chair for Emerge, and I'm going to be chairing this session. Uh, my day job these days is all non-executive and all education and ed tech, as well as working with Emerge. I also chair the Dyson Institute, which is the Dyson Company's in-house higher education play, and I also chair Pearson's UK subsidiary. Today, we're going to be talking about the promise of AI in education. So, as I'm sure you all know, the education market is valued at around $6 trillion, and it's forecast to grow to, I think, $10 trillion by 2030. And that's mostly going to be driven by advances in tech. I have to say, in my world, which covers K-12, tertiary, higher education, literally everyone is talking about AI. AI and generative AI, I think, has got the potential to fundamentally disrupt a centuries-long established approach to teaching, learning, and assessment. But then I guess we said that about MOOCs, we said it about Google, we said it about the internet, and we even said it about video back, back in the day. And of course, it's not just about education itself, but also the business of education with opportunities in workflow, back office, data, and lots more, and of course, in workplace learning. So short of total disruption, AI certainly creates a transformational opportunity in this category. I don't think we're going to crack it all today, but this short one hour, quite punchy session is going to deep dive into some of the most exciting subtrends based on Emerge's recent analysis of over 700 AI EdTech companies. Now, we're really thrilled to be joined by a panel of EdTech luminaries who are going to share their global perspectives on this topic. First of all, let me mention Jeff Madden Calder, who is CEO of Coursera, the leading learning platform. Jeff, one sentence about you and your thoughts about AI and education. Yeah, in a sentence, I'm happy to be here. I'm the CEO of Coursera. I've been here for seven and a half years. It was stunning to go through COVID when every school in the world shut down and went online. Coursera now serves more than 135 million learners and 7,000 institutions. We work with businesses, governments, and campuses. And I think that generative AI will be a more disruptive, enabling, um, but also threatening a new force in the education world, especially adult education. And so I'm really happy to be here and I'm really excited to talk about what the implications of this technology might be for this industry. Yeah, amazing, threatening and enabling. Let's keep those thoughts in mind. Uh, next up, I have Juliana Jaquetta, who's Senior Education Specialist and EdTech Guru at IFC, but also earlier in her career at um, both Coursera and the World Bank. Uh, Juliana, one sentence about yourself and anything you want to say about AI in education. Thank you, Mary, and good morning or afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. As Mary said, I work at the International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Bank Group. We are investors across sectors. In education, we focus on tech companies that have a huge impact in emerging markets. Um, we started with disability plays and are very interested in going into solutions that um, have better potential for for better outcomes, uh, understood as learning and employability. Uh, lead our ed tech work, and I'm proud to say I worked at Coursera, um, and I was there during the pandemic times, which had echo, uh, Jess, uh, showed us a lot of what potential, what technology can do in, in even more impactful ways. Thanks. Amazing, and we'll perhaps come back to you and talk about emerging markets um, later on in, in the session. Thanks, Juliana. Um, and then we have Simon Brown, who's Chief Learning Officer at Novartis, the innovative medicines company, and also serial EdTech advocate. Simon, what's your one sentence or two about yourself and AI in education? Yeah, thanks, Mary. Yeah, 25 years in uh, EdTech in a variety of roles of in-house consultant, uh, supplier, entrepreneur, etc. cetera. Um, Came across generative AI back at the beginning of this year, and my mind was blown. Um, I had a weekend in India playing with it, and uh, yeah, ever since then, I've been trying to learn everything I can around it, and uh, super excited by the opportunity that it presents. 
Fantastic, fantastic. And now just before I um, introduce Jan, who's going to do a, a bit of a presentation, could I just encourage everyone, please, to post questions and comments in the chat rather than the Q&A. Please use the chat. Um, and then hopefully we'll have some time um, towards the end of the session to pick up some of your questions. Um, and, and also, if you're posing a question and you want it directed at one of our guests, uh, our panelists particularly, just let me know that as well, and we'll try and, we'll try and pick that up. Fantastic. So my final introduction is Jan uh, Lynn Matten, who's a founding partner at Emerge. Um, Jan, I'm going to hand over to you now to introduce yourself and get us started on this topic. Perfect. Thank, thank you, Mary, and thanks to all of our panelists and a, a warm welcome from me as well. Um, as Mary says, my name's Jan. I'm a general partner here at Emerge. And as, as um, uh, you hopefully know, our mission here is to democratize access to opportunity by building the best first check for EdTech founders. All of us are deeply connected to that purpose. In my case, I'm an immigrant kid, got to Oxford on a scholarship, it changed my life and career prospects and dedicated my career to uh, democratizing access to opportunity after that. And similar stories across the whole team. Um, but education, of course, is not just a place to have impact, it's also um, a place that represents massive financial opportunity. And what I'm going to do now is I'm, I'm going to cover um, an intro to the overall markets and then go into our analysis of the AI opportunity in EdTech. And while doing that, I'll also invite all of our panelists to share their learnings um, through a few real life case studies. So with that, I'm going to ask everybody else to please mute and get started. Education is massive. It's a $6.2 trillion market. It's bigger than food, oil and gas, and information technology. Um, but as you, as you know, this market is only at the start of digitization. It's 4% digitized, and digital education services are growing at a 16% CAGR. So enormous opportunity. And within that, Europe is a global powerhouse. It represents 20% of global VC dollars uh, invested in education. Why is that? It's because number one, super active. We're tracking three and a half thousand new startups a year in Europe in EdTech. Two, it's a big market. Um, it's got wealthy consumers that are investing in their, in their own and in their kids' education. It's got a strong industrial base that is rapidly investing in upscaling its workforce. And three, European companies are, have this wonderful track record of scaling globally. So companies on this slide, like Multiverse, uh, Kahoot, CodeShop, they are creating global footprints, and that's leading them to raise huge growth rounds and multiple dollar valuations. And in general, European companies just think global from day one. Um, one example or anecdote from our portfolio, you know, the vast majority of companies we invest in are based in Europe. Yet 60 plus percent of our portfolio's revenue comes from the U.S. So that's one roof wine of this overall thesis. And you know, going forward, we see massive potential for new company creations, creation because there are just so many unsolved problems in education. We see three mega problem areas in education. The first is uh, around digitization. This is really around the idea that traditional education doesn't scale and we don't have enough teachers, universities, corporate training to satisfy the willingness to pay for high quality education That's delivery. For an example, on the current path, we would, we would have a 50% shortage of university places globally by 2035 if we don't change. Second problem area is around workforce development. Traditional education is not adapting at the speed of technological progress, which is resulting in 8.5 trillion dollar global skills gap in, across many industries in 20, by 2030. And then lastly, around personalized learning. So this is the idea that traditional education is still an industrial process in many ways, which perpetuates disadvantage and inefficiency. And the high quality education that undoubtedly many of us on this call have been the beneficiaries of is only available to the very smallest minority and that needs to change. So those are the big problems. And if you look at how the, they have been solved or attempted to be solved over the last 25 years, you can see that that's happened in three big waves. The first was education SaaS, companies that uh, like Blackboard and Degree, 
second wave were marketplaces and content companies like Coursera and Go One, and the third wave were um, tech-enabled services like Trilogy, Multiverse, and and Guild. But today, virtually all of the exciting companies that we are seeing are in this fourth category of AI-powered learning, and that's where we're expecting to invest the majority of our capital in the next three years. And we really believe that AI is the next big opportunity for EdTech because it's adding the human touch uh, to EdTech that these first three waves were, have, have, were, were missing in our view. Um, so what that means is we can now scale high quality pedagogy, yep. personalized learning for the kind of stuff that uh, traditionally only humans could do. And while today's unicorns sit at the bottom right of the two by two matrix that you can see here, so high scale, no efficacy, we believe there's the potential for tomorrow's unicorns to sit at the top right, so to achieve both high scale and high efficacy. And that would be really exciting because if that happens, it'll, it'll enable us to um, address market opportunities that we have hitherto not been able to address, like, for example, making one-to-one uh, -one personalized learning support available to the masses, uh, not just to, to, the, to, to the wealthiest, to be able to identify skills and potential based on people's um, output and, uh, and potential rather than their CVs. And then also to enable, um, to enable educators to spend more time building relationships with learners. So I've given you a sense of how big and active this market is, what the big problem areas are, how AI is dri driving the next wave of innovation. Um, and now we want to get really specific, uh, and we want to talk about how AI is being applied to education, uh, in, in the real world. And we'll do that through a mix of, on the one hand, case studies, and, and then on the other, a deeper market analysis. And I can't imagine a better place to start than asking Jeff, uh, the CEO of Coursera, to give you an overview of how AI is being applied at his company. So Jeff, take us away. So this has been really quite uh, an experience the last 12 months. Like uh, Simon, I started playing with ChatGPT in early December when our head of product said, Jeff, you got to check out this, this new capability. And we moved pretty quickly to try to figure out what might this mean for Coursera. At the time, it was mostly just large language models. Uh, Stable Diffusion was kind of playing around with image stuff. It was pretty much in, a, in this embassy. I don't think multi-modal models with text and images was really a thing at the time. But we figured this would have a really big impact on our business. So we started really trying to get our arms around what does the technology do and how might we use it for our business. There's two things that we really focused on in terms of primary movers of need. One is a lot of jobs are likely going to get displaced. A lot of people will need to find new careers as substantial portions of their jobs get automated. And we have something called Career Academy that basically skills people up with industry micro-credentials to train them for entry-level digital jobs. The second piece on the job side is Generative AI Academy. So we are launching, well, we launched the first piece of Gen AI Academy in November. It's Generative AI for everyone. This helps companies train everybody on Generative AI. And there's a bunch of experts who have written courses and labs and things to, to teach people how to use it. And also sensitize them to the ethical and, and risks associated with it. And then on the teaching and learning side, which Jan has kind of talked a little bit about, we jumped on three things immediately. Number one is language translations. So a lot of people don't realize that the technology underlying GPT has really improved the capabilities of language translation. We can now translate courses, full courses, that used to cost us $10,000 per course language pair we can now do for about $20. And so we've translated 4,200 courses into 17 languages, uh, the full course, the transcripts, the buttons, the quizzes, everything. And the quality is quite good. It's not perfect yet, but it's quite good. And it's so fast and so inexpensive that we're just retranslating all the time. Every time new models come out, we're just, you're retranslating them. So it can, it's changed the, the dynamics entirely of global accessibility to, to education. The second big thing that we've been working on is the personalized uh, learning. And we have something called Coach. So this is the personalized tutoring. I won't talk about this in a ton of detail, but what I will say is it's 
really amazing, not what we've done, but what these underlying models can do when you give them the right context. So the way we worked it out is that like Conmigo, and there's a couple other of these types of personalized uh, chatbots, when a learner asks a question, the, our, our software finds all the relevant parts of the course that might be key to answering the question. And then generative AI essentially summarizes that and then delivers an answer. But, but the learner can get answers to uh, questions they have about the content, skills that they're gonna learn, what should they do with their career? What courses should they take if they want to learn this skill? Uh, it's just really striking how capable this technology is as a, as a personalized learning assistant and career counselor. And then the third part is course builder. So we're giving educators the ability with natural language to say, I want to teach this topic to this audience. Find me the best experts from around the world and pull together a custom course that I can deliver to my audience, whether that's Simon at Novartis or whether that's a professor at FPT University in Vietnam, uh, the ability to use natural language to pull in guest lectures, sort of experts around the world to deliver uh, you know, custom courses is another major piece of it. And there's also a lot on the personalized learning that has to do with assessments and academic integrity. We could talk about that in more detail, but it's just pretty striking how broad the application of this technology is to what we do in EdTech. Amazing, thank you, Jeff. Um, we'll come back to you for Q&A in a bit. I'll kick us off on the deeper market analysis before coming back to Simon and Juliana. All right, thank you. So um, that's a really exciting overview of how um, AI is driving impacts in one of the large incumbent companies in the industry. Um, and what I now wanna do is to share, share our research with you. So as Mary mentioned, we looked at 700 companies, which we culled about 200 and ended up with sort of a pool of 500, both startups and then some incumbents that are applying AI in a meaningful way out of these three mega problems I talked about. Um, we have found eight high level categories uh, within that pool of 500 um, that, uh, of how AI is being applied in EdTech. And then for each of these categories, we've created a hotness score, which is composed of the number of startups being created, the amount of funding that these companies are raising in the last 12 months, the perceived threat from incumbents. So how easy is it for incumbents to actually adopt these new models versus how difficult is it to, to disrupt them in our view? And then lastly, our own level of excitement about the category. So here you can see all eight categories from AI-enabled knowledge graphs at the top to simulation-based learning at the bottom. And you can also see for each of these categories how the hotness score was composed, as well as the subsectors of education that this category is most active in on the right. And I'll go into each of these categories now in a second to give you detail on what they are and some company examples. But I want to make three quick points on this, on this slide. The first one is what you're seeing here in terms of hotness is a reflection of where the early hype has landed. So the first applications of AI are about text generation. And, or I should say the first applications of generative AI are about text generation. And that obviously lends itself to things like powering digital teacher avatars, that's the robo teacher category, or helping teachers create classroom materials, that's, that's the educator co-pilot category. Conversely, many of the lower scoring categories here are more complex applications of, of AI to education. So going beyond text generation to things like using AI for assessment of learner progress. And we believe that many of these categories with lower hotness scores today have great potential to produce game-changing applications in the future. They're just less obvious to people today. And then the third point is um, this table only shows startup activity, but we've also tracked what incumbents have done in these different categories. And as we've already seen, some incumbents, like Coursera, have been quick to adopt this new technology. And as investors in startups, uh, we obviously are looking for AI opportunities that fundamentally challenge the status quo and thus have the potential to disrupt incumbents. And so far, we can say we, we can't say for certain which categories are going to produce such disruptive opportunities versus won't. But what we can say is that we have seen many individual cases of companies where we do believe that there is th that potential and that they're sitting across all, all eight. So I'm now going to uh, take you through a brief description of each of these categories to give more color. Um, and then we'll, we'll go into some case studies as well. 
So um, four of these eight categories are all about making learning more engaging. And those are uh, robot teacher, hyper-personalized content, always on feedback and simulation-based stuff. So to start with robot teacher. So this is, these are AI powered academic tutors, language tutors, performance coaches, parenting assistants, in the form of two-way conversational interface. This companies in this category are building applications on top of large language models that ensure their content is delivered in a format and at a level that is appropriate to each user. As I mentioned, this is one of the most active categories in terms of both company creation and the amount of investment that's been attracted. And we see this as an incredibly exciting opportunity because one-on-one -on -one learning support has been shown through academic research to be much more effective than classroom teaching, but traditionally have been too expensive to scale to the majority of learners. And we're starting to see some early cases of success, um, including companies like Khan Amigo, which was mentioned earlier, uh, Numerate, which has reached uh, 100 million users reportedly, uh, the company Speak, which uh, is in the language learning space, which has raised to the large Series B recently. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of uh, activity, you know, every single week of companies trying to tackle specific Subverticals of education uh, with a robot teacher approach. Uh, for example, performance coaching is a company I talked to today, um, or even to attempt uh, to build middleware services where they're creating a sort of robot teacher as a service that other companies then can plug into and, and use. So, this robot teacher category is one that we're really excited about. Second category I want to talk about is hyper personalized content. So, this is about companies that are tackling um, early years reading, audio and learning, and also self-improvement for adults. And what I'd like you to do is to imagine traditional edutainment content, but turns interactive and hyper-personalized to the end user. So uh, we think the potential here is to make content more engaging across all subjects and thus hopefully to raise attainment across the bar. We also think this model could uh, seriously undermine traditional content producers of its scales. Uh, and a useful analogy here might be the company character.ai, which sits outside of education. Um, they provide users with a digital brand that you can speak to 24 seven. It's blown up, achieving over 4 million monthly active users in September. Obviously you know, it didn't exist at, at the start of the year. Um, and in education, we're seeing some interesting activity here too. So. Um, the first start has been around interactive reading applications in the early years space, as well as the creation of hyper-personalized audio content. Um, but we're also increasingly seeing teams go after this character.ai for kids opportunity, trying to create uh, digital companions for kids that are safe and education oriented. It's potentially a more controversial topic, but one that is attracting a lot of activity. The third category is always on feedback. Uh, this category is about providing professionals with helpful feedback to improve performance. Feedback is how we grow as professionals. But if you ask, 65% six, of employees say they don't receive enough feedback. And so at the same, um, but, but at the same time, we now live in a world where a lot of the stuff that we do at work is recorded, whether it's video calls or screen recordings or you know, digital uh, work artifacts. Uh, we live in a world where there's now theoretically enough data to enable generative AI companies to capture our work products and then evaluate performance and provide us with detailed feedback on how we can improve. And so companies in this category are trying to provide personalized in the flow of work feedback based on observed behavior at work. This could be work product, could be interactions with colleagues or clients. Large language models are okay at giving feedback, but they're not out of the box. They're not world-class. And so companies in this category have to a, um, have lots of user interaction data to be able to train their models and B, they have to train their models on how to spot key moments in conversation and then what good looks like for those key moments. And that's a really tough product challenge. We've seen a number of interesting companies that are trying to tackle that product challenge. And by the way, this is complete white space. There are no education specific incumbents, but we're seeing roughly half the number of companies in this category being created uh, relative to robo teachers. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty active. You're probably all familiar with Grammarly who kind of pioneered this space. Um, that's a company which is focused on providing feedback on spelling, grammar, tone of written text. Uh, but what we're really excited about are 
you know, companies that are moving away from language to more complex evaluation of interpersonal skills, teaching, decision-making, negotiations, leadership, sales. Um, and yeah, no leaders here yet, but one, uh, one, but, but a category that we're incredibly excited about and we cannot wait to make an investment in. The fourth category in the first section um, is simulation-based learning. It makes a lot of sense, uh, of course, to practice high stakes situations in benign feedback environments, such as simulations. That's what gave birth to the flight simulator. And, you know, nowadays we have simulation companies that are going beyond flight simulation. We have uh, simulation in surgery and mining, even basic customer interactions to train reps. Um, but what gener generative AI is doing, in our view, is to unlock uh, that same flight simulation sim simulator training for more complex interpersonal situations where you need the simulation to be fully dynamic and respond to you as you, as you, as you go. So, for example, job interviews, sales pitches, uh, negotiations, that kind of stuff. And it's a, one way of, of summarizing it, um, you know, this, this category is about flight simulator for interpersonal skills. We think it's a, 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 com a category where, where companies will be very capital intensive because this will require content technology and pedagogy and assessment. Um, so also deep expertise required to do this. And as a result, this so far has been the least active category and as a result has the, the lowest hotness score. Um, and, and we actually think that incumbents may have an advantage in this category because you, you do need all of those different things. Um, but it is a, comp a category that we love. We've seen some really impressive early examples of companies tackling different use cases. Um, I've loved um, a job interview practice tool that I had access to. Um, and yeah, we're, we're eager to see what, what is to come. So those are the first four categories. I now want to jump into one uh, real life example of a company applying these, these principles and then we'll do the second four. So the company is called Fundamate. It's a cross-platform AI co-pilot for students, which is enabling them to effortlessly access quality study materials and knowledge. Um, it is trained on curriculum data, past uh, exam papers, model, model answers to those exam papers. And then on top of that, billions of user interactions with the tool, which enables it to provide students with resources and support for homework, exam prep, and then also university applications using natural language. Key points to note here, um, this is designed for users that have access to WhatsApp, but who cannot afford data to browse the internet. So this is focused on emerging markets. And this is a white space opportunity that no one's catering to. Um, and it's just led to massive calls. So fund has grown um, 4X this year. It grew 5X the year before. Um, it's now over 3 million users. Um, so similar kind of categ size category as character.ai that we were talking about earlier. And you know, tutoring is a massive market, but it only caters to the top 25% um, in developed countries. It probably doesn't touch the top 5% in developing countries. So if you can achieve massive scale and monetize uh, users um, through, through this low-cost approach, I think you have a, the potential to build a, a massive business. What's the moat here? Initially, it comes from partnerships with governments that uh, give them, are giving them access to this training data. But over time, it really lies in the, the virality, the viral growth of this model, which gives them access to these billions of user interactions to train their models with and just make them better every single day. And um, yeah, we think this company has the potential to ma maintain differentiation at scale as a, as a result and hopefully to create a completely new category. So this is one example of a, of a robot team. Okay, I'm going to move us on by clicking the correct button and actually going forward. Here we go. Um, and talk about the four um, AI categories in the family of making work and teaching more efficient. So uh, we have AI-enabled knowledge graphs, educator co-pilots, automated assessment, and democratized authorship here. To start with AI-enabled knowledge graphs, a bit of context, if you, if you think about how we access our data today in organizations um, or even as an individual, um, it's, it's obvious that it's broken. We have these tree structure folders that you have to put data into. It's incredibly time consuming to add metadata like tags to make things more easily findable later on. And then when it comes to trying to get insights out of our data, we have to search using keywords and tags. Um, and 
all we really want to do is just use natural language to query all the knowledge and all the data that we have and to get a natural language response. And that's the core concept of AI knowledge graphs. Um, it's to enable individuals and organizations to capture unstructured data, to dynamically categorize it, and then to handle complex retrieval queries using natural language. It's uh, top of our list. It's, it's also one of the hottest uh, categories. One of the reasons why it's so exciting is, is we don't think incumbents are set up to do this. Um, the, the incumbent companies and, for example, knowledge management rely on structured data. Um, they rely on data outside the organization, but what we think is required to build an AI knowledge graph is to A, be able to uh, deal with unstructured data and B, to have access to high quality data from each client from inside the organization. And so in other words, this is really about the user experience and solving real problems for end users, thus incentivizing them to share their data with you and then to enable you to build that graph. So. That's, that's why we think it's, it's difficult, but exciting to build in this category. The subcategory here that we saw the most activity in was so far in improving access to academic knowledge. So these are companies like Elicit, um, or our portfolio company Causally, which um, indexes the world corpus of medical knowledge, and then enables researchers to understand the concepts and relationships between concept, uh, both papers. Another category that we're hugely interested in here, um, and seeing more activity in is the idea of creating models for skill assessment based on a specific client company's definition of top performance. And that could then have applications in recruitment or career progression. We have a company called Zavi that's starting to do that. Um, but yeah, equally excited about knowledge management and second brains for individuals and career navigation. So this is really a, a, an awesome category. Um, where we're seeing a lot. Second one um, is educator co-pilots. Teachers, as, as you know, spend about a third of their time on planning, preparation, marking, uh, school homework. Learning designers in enterprises and corporates spend billions every year outsourcing the creation of learning materials to agencies and studios. And if you think about it, you know, creating these kind of materials, again, is a, is a natural place for generative um, AI for large language models to play a role because they're excellent at generating text. So companies here are about enabling learning designers and educators to create learning materials and manage learners at scale. This is the second hottest category. We're seeing a lot of activity here also from incumbents. We just saw an example of Coursera's course builder. And quite interestingly, the most uh, startup creation is in co-pilots for teachers. However, we think despite the hype around that, it's Probably not a category that we think will create massive companies just because of how difficult it is to sell into K-12. Conversely, there's less startup creation, but way more funding in uh, educated co-pilots focused on learning and development, so corporates. And these are um, interactive, rich media course creation tools. Uh, one example here is Colossian, our portfolio company, which we'll talk about in a second, which is uh, using proprietary text to video models to generate video courses. Moving us on, um, we have automated assessment. So this is about assessing learners and candidates um, and uh, creating efficiencies in, in that process. Uh, you know, human-led marking is fraught with uh, inconsistencies and bias. And there's been a, a long-standing dream of using technology to automate uh, assessment. And it's looking like that may become a possibility now with generative AI. This one requires a lot of expertise. Again, you know, you need both subject matter expertise and, and content knowledge around test creation and model answers, et cetera. And obviously the technological expertise around uh, using NLP for assessment. So, so far, but a middling category, the, the focus so far has been around academic integrity uh, to identify AI-based cheating companies like G GPT-0. Um, many of you will be familiar with um, the how 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 challenge or how, how doubtful uh, folks in the industry are about the validity of such approaches, given how many false positives and uh, negatives they generate. Um, but it's uh, nevertheless a very active subcategory. Another one is around uh, candidate sourcing through companies like Hirebee. But where we see the really big opportunities um, in this automated assessment category are number one around. Um, auto-grading of, of academic work. Um, this is really the holy grail. 
could save education providers billions of dollars every year if, if the technology gets accurate enough to be adopted. And then the second one is around uh, pre-hire assessments. So helping companies use AI to assess candidates and make better hiring decisions. The cost of a bad hire is massive. Um, and, uh, and, and, so, and, and there's potential for technology to, to play a role. We have a company called Skills Trust that's, that's attempting to do this. And we see this as a huge, exciting opportunity. And then lastly, but not least, uh, democratized authorship. So startups in this category are focused on AI-powered creation of study uh, nodes, mind maps, interactive flashcards, um, other learning materials. Every learner creates learning materials and notes. What if AI could make that process 10 times more effective or 10, you know, make your notes 10 times better? Um, this is one of those categories where, again, some of the biggest leaps have been done by incumbents. Companies like Quizlet and Coursera who've quickly moved to add AI authoring features to their products to reduce the time to create content or to increase their content capabilities. For example, uh, Coursera has this feature where you can let it quiz you about a document that you upload to its platform. Um, but we also are seeing new startups being created here and um, particularly around uh, giving learners the power to create and manipulate learning materials to suit their own needs. And some of those products are exhibiting phenomenal growth. We are very excited to be announcing an investment in this category soon. I will tell, about you, tell, tell you about it then. Um, but yeah, so this gives you an overview of, of you know, we looked at 500 companies. They sit in these eight categories. Hopefully it gives you kind of a sense of where, where this world's going. We're going to do two more case studies now, um, and I'm going to let Simon go first uh, and talk about Colossian. So Simon, over to you. Thanks very much, Jan. Um, so alongside my day job at Novartis, I'm also a venture partner at Emerge. Uh, and earlier this year, they introduced me to Dominic, the CEO of Colossian, and got to see some of the exciting features that Colossian uh, provides. Um, if you're not familiar with Colossian, it's, uh, it's an AI-powered video creation tool. So it creates video avatars for workplace learning. Um, we're using it at, uh, at Novartis. I actually first used it um, in a more personal capacity um, for a, a podcast. And um, in, like Jeff, my experimentation with uh, Gen AI, we actually got um, ChatGPT to script our podcast. And I wanted to create a, a video of the, uh, the avatar for... Um, the chat GPT. Um, and so there was a, a free trial version of Colossian available, went in, had a play with that and was, uh, very impressed at how very quickly it took the script that chat GPT had produced, uh, and it created a, a talking head video avatar, uh, that we were able to use for promotional material uh, around it. So off the back of how easy that was, um, I then pointed our learning innovation team at Novartis to, uh, to take a look at it. And, um, after their evaluation, we've now brought it on board. Um, why are we using it within Novartis? Um, I guess a number of benefits. It provides an alternative to what we'd have done previously, which is using expensive studios or con content production agencies to produce video, uh, or trying to do it through ourselves, through, uh, iPhones and things, which is, uh, never normally, uh, all that great quality. So, uh, it makes it very easy to produce. Uh, it also gives us the ability to use talking head video where we wouldn't otherwise be able to, where uh, it's just cost prohibitive um, and we otherwise present things in, in text format. Um, Jeff mentioned the power earlier of um, translation um, and that applies into the, the talking head video as well. So for our enterprise um, mandatory learning, we have to produce learning in 17 languages. With Blossium, we can produce it as a video talking head and then translate it and have it speak in 17 languages. So, uh, it saves us a huge amount of time, a huge amount of money. Uh, also been very impressed with the ability to actually create avatars. So we created an avatar of one of our senior leaders, used that at a, a leadership conference and uh, actually sort of had this leader's avatar, um, presenting on the, the big screen and then suddenly switching into speaking a, a foreign language to, uh, surprise people. So, um, it's very powerful when we, uh, we use it in the right way from an investor perspective. So, uh, video training is a massive category. There's a significant spend that goes on it. Um, and Colossium provides new use cases for video content where we can actually use it where we couldn't have otherwise done it because it was uh, prohibitively expensive. So they're creating uh, a new market for uh, access to video at a different price point. 
also that's interesting where um, if training teams are under price uh, or budget pressures, then actually where they wouldn't have been able to afford to do something before, actually they can do now more sophisticated learning um, for, for a lower budget, which may drive more people to actually take advantage of the tool as well. Uh, we looked at a few different players. Um, there's a few different sort of um, video production companies like this out there. Um, the interesting thing with Colossian is their specialism around learning though. Uh, and technology that they have that allows not just a straight on talking head, but actually scenarios. So you can have a, a person talking to a doctor, you can have a sales situation, you can see uh, the avatars from uh, different ways. And for me, you know, what we're seeing today is the very early days of this technology. So I think as, uh, as they innovate, and I know they've got big plans for how they innovate, I think we're just going to see uh, the use cases getting uh, more and more interesting as the technology gets better. And um, so overall, I guess in summary, you see it as a, a very powerful AI authoring tool. Um, and within our L and B teams, it means that people can actually get hands on and very quickly create and maintain, you know, engaging video content where it would have been uh, way more expensive or prohibitively expensive to do before. So hopefully that provides a, a bit of an overview. Jan, back to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Simon. And then I'll hand straight over to Juliana to talk about Ravello as well. Thank you, Jan. Um, I'm going to tell you about the company we invested in 2019. It's a Brazilian company called Ravello. It is uh, a, a recruitment company powered by AI. And what they do is that they um, to help uh, source, vet, hire, and manage developers in the same time zone. Usually they tap it to uh, talent bases in Latin America and they source it to North America, but there's other sorts of matches. That's the bigger uh, use case. And even before LLMs became available, they were using machine learning models to take data from uh, on skills from CVs and as well as from job descriptions, learn patterns and optimize uh, the matches. Now, LLMs, what they um, allow them to do is to expand the use case and find better ways to assess or alternative ways to assess skills from candidates, also to further improve the accuracy and the recommendations and to further make standardize the data on skills in such a fragmented environment. So the three main use cases I describe is now they're taking uh, AI-powered skill scoring. So the LLM is able to read CVs, automate and extract relevant information and introduce it into standardized taxonomies to produce more accurate scorings and rankings. And this ultimately improves the quality of the matching. They also are using video-based AI assessments, which complement the data and the information that comes from um, multiple choice assessments, which are not their questions around its accuracy, but they are also limiting and often not popular with some digital work with some tech workers. And so they, so they use avatars to pose questions, the candidates self-report themselves, and then based on this, this uh, spoken language during the video, uh, they're able to extract information about the candidate's ability on technical strength, on confidence, on English, um, you know, the ability to speak in English um, flu with fluency, and therefore complement the type of information that you have on the skills and also feed that into the, their recommendation. And the third use case has to do with enhanced matching. So it, it is probably the hardest and still something they're working on to do, but they're leveraging their own data on millions of interactions between the candidates and the companies, as well as information on skills and job description to train new models and generate more accurate short lists and recommendations. So we are excited about this company because we feel half of the job is to build skills and a lot of ed tech has had to do with accessibility and learning um, for, for, for good reason. There's lots of work to do there, but we also see a huge uh, gap in, in, in the skills. Well, there's a huge skills mismatch globally. Uh, and there's a lot of inefficiencies in the transition from education to work. The data is uh, quite structured, uh, quite fragmented on skills, and there's a lot of work to do to smooth in those transitions. So the mode that this company has uh, is they're very uh, innovative. They have a very good um, handle on the skills landscape in Latin America and able to source developers to North American companies that are facing scarcity, but also that can get top talent for uh, lower salary prices. This company has been growing 
um, you know, grew very rapidly in certain days. They're still growing at 20% year-on-year -year growth. And right now they have a 20 million RRR. So we, we continue to be excited to see how they continue to innovate uh, on the integration of new AI technology. Awesome. Thank you both. Um, Mary, I'll hand over to you now to chair the Q&A. Um, and I'll stop sharing screen so we can see all of our wonderful panelists. So Mary, over to you. Okay, fantastic. And uh, thanks so much, Jan. I, it, this is a fast moving area. It's, uh, this presentation has changed in, in the last month since, since I last <laughs> heard, heard it. So, um, so that's great. Um, Jeff, let me, let me come to you first um, as, uh, if, if you like an incumbent. Um, what should CEOs actually do to build a, an AI roadmap? What, the, what does the playbook look, for, look like for adopting AI? Asking for a friend, by the way. Hey, you're right. Well, thanks, Mary. I'm actually building a course. We, we just launched Generative AI Academy for everyone. I mentioned that in November. In, in the Q1, we're going to do Generative AI for execs, for, for leaders and for CEOs. I'm building a course called a CEO playbook to Generative AI. And it's really tricky because on the one hand, you want to be pretty grounded in what's happening in the world right now. On the other hand, it's changing so fast that it really is valuable for CEOs to think about it the right way. So a lot of what my course tries to talk about is how should you think about your role as a CEO? How should you think about the capabilities of generative AI? How should you think about ways to create value in your business? How do you set strategy? What are the risks, the legal issues? the data security concerns, the ethical considerations that you should have. Like, how should you think about all that? So I do think that a lot of what CEOs need to do is to stay at a high enough level where they have a framework for thinking about this that's durable, but then close enough to the technology. As, as Simon said, I think we're all in the same boat. We, you can't really learn about this unless you use it. So I think CEOs really need to do both things. They need frameworks for thinking about this, and then they need hands-on experience actually doing it. That's, that's the way I'm approaching it. In terms yeah, of, and, yeah, go ahead, Mary. Know, I, was, I, was just going to, I was just going to say, and you know, how, do, how do you create an advantage with AI if, if everyone has access to the same, the same technology? You know, is, it, is it just like an arms race of who thinks about it best? What, what's your thinking on that? It's, it's, it's obviously tricky. Our, our founder, Andrew Ng, famously many years ago said that AI is the new electricity and asking, well, how could a company take advantage of electricity and become, you know, a, a valuable company with some sustainable advantage? I think a lot of it is more about how you use it than how it works and how you use it as a business gets to how does it fit into your business model in a way that creates real value for a customer in a big enough market with decent economics with advantages that cannot be competed away by others. We personally are not doing a lot of training of models right now. We're not. The models are improving so fast. The foundational models are improving so fast. We're not even doing almost any fine tuning other than just learning about it because fine tuning is becoming obsolete very rapidly. And the basic capabilities that so many companies are creating in their proprietary models are getting obliterated when Gemini Ultra comes out or when GPT-4 comes out or 4V or GPT-5 or Cloud you know, 2.1. I really think that companies trying to build their own models at this stage of the game, I, I wouldn't say never do it. I would say be, be pretty cautious because it's changing so quickly. Instead, I would say, think about your business model where do you create value for customers? How do you acquire customers? How do you serve customers? What is the nature of your talent that can learn and change and apply this new type of technology to solving problems faster than ever before? And then a final one I'll just say is, I think there's going to be a lot of m and I think there'll be way more m and deals than IPOs because way more of these types of things, and Jan, I totally agree with you in all those categories, and, and some, there will be big breakup companies, but there's also gonna be a lot of acquisitions, I think, where big companies, incumbents cannot move fast enough. They see something that really works well as a feature, and they, they buy the feature and they buy the team. I would suggest <clears> that small teams be thinking at least about a feature as a service. I'd be at Coursera, we are definitely wiring into other service players so that we don't have to, invent the entire landscape of generative AI, we can plug into services that then harness our business model and our distribution and our customer base. 
Yeah, so so important to remember that the humans are going to be the most important factor in uh, in uh, really getting the potential out of this market. Um, Juliana, let me let me come on to you, um, and it'd just be really interesting for you to unpack a bit more how AI brings new opportunities, particularly for uh, edtech innovation, but in in emerging markets. Just interesting to hear a bit more about that. Sure, Mary. So what I've seen is AI bringing a renewed sense of uh, promise in terms of what edtech can do to help people learn, acquire skills, knowledge and uh, also support the transitions to employability, right? There's been this promise for some time, but there's also this generalized feeling in some quarters that it's not lived up to its expectations. And I think Gen AI is bringing a new sense of possibility to the sector, uh, and at the same time, so, so a, a bit of caution and issues, some of those that Jeff mentioned, but mostly a sense of possibility. I think for emerging markets, it's important to keep in mind the vastness and the magnitude of the challenges that are being faced. To give you two examples, one has to do with learning achievement. And I don't know if many of you saw last week, uh, the OECD published the latest results of PISA, uh, 2002 data. And there are two striking things, in many ways not surprising, but average levels of learning have declined in most countries, but much more so in emerging markets. And two, the what the gaps are in men. So to give you a sense, 75% of Latin American students are below basic proficiency in math, 55% below basic proficiency in reading. So the, the, the challenge is large. There's also a challenge with upskilling for youth and adults. Many countries have very high populations of um, adolescents that do not ha are not in education for an employment and training the need. And there's a big question how to compete, how this will countries compete against more developed markets that have much better stock of digital skills and firms are much better positioned for tech adoption, right? So in that context, I think the opportunities with AI are made very similar to what they are for developed markets, right? With uh, the co-pilots for teachers to meet students where they are, to make them more insightful with uh, learning data. Also, the tutors for students, for sure. I've heard a lot about, you know, the premise from South Khan and Bill Gates talking about this. I, I believe there's true potential there. But I think for AI, for emerging markets, there's also th three distinct um, promises. One has to do with making AI more of a leveler. How can you, you know, it usually is adopted by the top 15, 20% of learners that are more motivated, more informed. But then there's a vast proportion of learners that don't really access these tools. So ca how can now these tools, hopefully over time, more accessible, lower cost, can support teachers in a way that makes a difference in their learning? That's number one. The number two is to make products more contextually relevant. So I hear a lot from colleagues at the World Bank that they say, look, you know, these amazing global products are, are, are fantastic, but they're not really adopted at scale in the Middle East or in Africa because they don't reflect local culture. They, before they didn't reflect local languages. And that, as Jeff said, this has been, you know, addressed largely um, for now at a fraction of the cost and much more rapidly in a wider number of languages, but there's still the issue of context relevance, which is very important um, for a wide adoption in emerging markets. And the third one is very, you know, aligned to my case study in Rivello, it doesn't stop with learning. Learning needs to be put at the use for something. And that is jobs. It's the next step of the talent pack one. So we are very interested in solutions. Then they can make sense of skills data and help, you know, reduce the fragmentation of the space and provide this information in digestible ways to drive decisions at the individual level, at the company level, and at the government level to make, to support workforce decisions and, and, and facilitate displacement. So this is a, to give you a sense on the impact side. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Thank you. And I've um, I've just looked at the clock and realised that I've done a very bad job at keeping us on time. Push. Um, Simon, just very briefly, if you would, how should large corporates be thinking about the opportunities that AI brings to the employee journey? But also, I read somewhere that um, an analyst was saying, you know, the older the student, the bigger the opportunity. I noticed someone's asked in the chat, what are the opportunities for younger people? I just wonder if you could comment very briefly on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I think for, for large organizations, it's, it's how do you, how do you manage through the unknown? Uh, how do you create the curiosity across the organization so that people feel comfortable to experiment, 
feel comfortable to be able to build the skills and, and to learn and building on what Jeff was saying around what can the CEO do, they're not going to come up with the exact use case that is going to be most profitable for, for the company. They need to create the, the safety across the organization and the environment where people can build the skills, can be playing, experimenting, and out of that will come the ways that people will, will find the value. So uh, with large organizations, it's doing that in a safe way. So making sure we're being mindful of all of the, the risks that are, that are there as well, but creating that environment. Uh, and I think that's across, I'm, I'm not sure age necessarily plays a, a factor in here. I think you know, everyone can be building these new skills, um, but these skills we need to be mindful are going to be changing faster and faster and faster. We've seen prompt engineering. We didn't hear it mentioned last year. And yet this year, you know, it's one of the, one of the hot new skills. And as we start to see Gen AI having an impact, we're going to see the skills associated with it just getting ratcheted up and, and you know, needing to be building them faster and faster. So I think large organizations need to make sure that they've got the agility within their organizations to be able to rapidly pivot and build the new skills that are needed to be able to adopt these, these new Gen AI tools. Yeah, there's lots of data around, isn't there? Just how quickly day-to-day -day job roles and the things that people have to do and be able to, to manage in, in jobs are just changing. Absolutely. So and it's not going to slow down. Only going to get faster. It's not, yep. to, it's not going to slow down at all. Um, now, let's see. I think I'm running out of um, time here, so I do apologize for that. Um, Jan, before I wrap up, do you want to just give me a 30-second takeaway uh, from what you've heard from the session and the uh, uh, comments that we've had from our panel. Yeah, I think, um, and and I think we should maybe try and tackle uh, some of these questions in the in the Q and A in the follow up because they're great great questions. Exactly. Um, thank you everybody for for uh, putting them there. And sorry we couldn't get to them, but yeah, I, I think we're we're hearing um, that you know AI is. An exciting field in education that has vast uh, applicability across different fields and uh, startups, big companies, organizations are all engaging with it. Um, it's certainly still in the hype phase. I think one participant wrote a question about that where we no doubt will We'll find uh, several players lying by the wayside at some point mm -hmm. over the next year, but um, yeah, we do believe in the long-term potential of, of this and the, the massive impact that it will have in education. Thank you, everybody, for your, for your insights. Yeah, thank, thanks, um, everybody. I think the standout for me was, I think, Jan, you said that only 4% of education is digitized at the moment. And so, okay, we've got 96% of the market to go after here. That sounds exciting. Yes. Listen, I want to thank everyone who's done dialed in to this webinar for coming along. Thanks also to Jeff. Simon and Juliana, and of course to Jan and the team at Emerge. Enjoy the rest of your day or your evening. Happy holidays, and here's to a confident EdTech investment year in 2024. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>